Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a great presentation today uh, brought to you by Natasha Murphy. And just for anyone that's here for the first time uh, taking part of um, our webinar series, this is part of the Shedding Light Public Talk series. And this is facilitated to showcase uh, different folks doing research and or practicing environmental stewardship in different ways. And this is brought to you by Still Moon Art Society, uh, creating vibrant communities through the arts and nature. And all activities that are done uh, by Still Moon Art Society are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Soilatooth nations. And myself personally, I live in Surrey, and so my my a lot of my livelihood is based in the unceded territories of the Kwantlen, Katsi, uh, and Semiamu First Nations, among others, um, which is kind of contested right now and kind of an interesting debate. But in any case, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Natasha. Thank you so much, Natasha, for being here and, and for accepting this uh, opportunity. And yeah, super excited to hear what you're what you've been doing and what you've been up to. So. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Adrian. Super. So yes, I'm Natasha. Today I'm going to be talking about targeted browsing using GOATS. So a bit of an outline here. I'm going to introduce myself, uh, talk a little bit about me, and then we're going to get right into invasive plant species and the current control methods. And then we're going to talk about an alternative method using GOATS. Uh, I'm going to highlight a few of the projects that I've worked on and then do a little bit of self-promoting uh, talking about uh, the new company my partner and I just started called VI Goatscaping. And these are a few of our, our goats. Uh, I just took this photo a couple or last week. So they have their fuzzy fur coats. This is Vindaloo and Cookie. All right, so I grew up in the Lower Mainland. I'm just gonna lower this down uh, and we had lots of outdoor activities and my family um, would go on camping adventures and some of which would bring us to Vancouver Island. I always knew that the island is where I wanted to end up um, and so here I am now on Vancouver Island. I started, I moved here about three years ago, lived in Duncan and now I'm up in Nanaimo with my, my partner Jasper. I've always had a great passion for nature and the environment, and of course, a great love of animals. So including horses, dogs, birds, and of course now goats. I did my schooling at SFU and BCIT, and I'm hopeful for a positive change. This is Logan and I up on one of our favorite hikes, Cobble Hill, little cutie. And here are some photos here of uh, what brought me to the island. So here is uh, one of the hawks, a few of the hawks uh, from the raptors. So I started, I took the job, kind of an excuse to move to the island because I, I knew that this is where I wanted to end up. Um, so this is a Harris hawk and one of our red tail hawks, Odin. We were doing some bird control at the landfill up in Cedar. Uh, here's the horse that I'm currently leasing, Danny, he's such a good boy, and our new puppy, Dax. So I've always been surrounded with animals and definitely love them. They're an important part of my life. All right, so invasive plant species, what are they? So by definition, according to the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia, invasive species are plants, animals, or other organisms not native to BC whose introduction and spread harms the province's native species and economy. So invasives have the ability to disrupt the composition, structure, and function of native ecosystems. So you can see in this photo, the, all the purpley pink uh, flowers and uh, weeds that belongs to the spotted knapweed plant. So I took this photo in uh, interior BC. So you can see that it's creating a sort of dense monoculture and that's prohibiting native plants from growing and establishing at all, really disrupting that ecosystem. So some current control methods include mechanical mowing or weed whacking and hand pulling. But this can cause great damage to uh, the surrounding environment and other species as well. 
um, you can see the zone of compaction, this big tire rut that uh, the tractor or mowing machine is creating. So you can see all the way down and highlight there, um, lower into the soil, it's really compacting that soil and wrecking all of the root systems of any potential native plant from growing. Uh, but if you look at the cow, that zone of compaction is a little bit smaller. And then a goat, that zone of compaction will be smaller still. And they'll also, in some cases, aerate the soil. Now, while these methods can be fast and thorough, uh, weed whacking and mowing, uh, it can be very damaging to the soil, as you can see with the zones of compaction. And weed whacking can also spread seeds, whereas the goats will consume the seeds and reduce the viability once they pass through the, the rumen and digestive system of the goat. So other Methods include chemicals, so spraying herbicides or pesticides, as well as burning. So these methods can be fast and thorough. You can really get a large area sort of totally eradicated of the weeds, but also all of the surrounding uh, vegetation as well. So there could be um, weeds in an area, but then there could also be some native plant species that we don't want to harm or, or kill or damage in any way. Um, it can also be very damaging to the soil. Oops, sorry. Uh, to the soil microorganisms. Skip ahead on my other little thing. There we go. And um, just widespread harm to uh, the surrounding environment. And there are also restrictions near water bodies. So we can't spray chemicals next to a stream or in a lake because of the fish habitat and even the downstream environment. So we're spraying in one area. Well, it could be next to a water body or um, taking that into the stream and uh, damaging the ecosystems downstream as well. And if you look at this guy, he's on a big heavy tractor and he's spraying chemicals, so not ideal. He is kind of maybe wearing safety glasses that look more just like sunglasses, but not good overall. So an alternative method, goats. So they are an effective uh, biocontrol. So biocontrol, meaning uh, they're an animal used to control another species. So in this case, we're using goats to control invasive plant species. Goats are environmentally friendly. And as I mentioned, they aerate the soil. And of course, they fertilize the soil with their droppings. Uh, compost from goats is definitely one of the better compost out there. Uh, our garden is doing great with our goat compost so far. Um, this is a picture of a few of our goats um, at a site nearby our house in Nanaimo here. They're chewing away on a whole bunch of English ivy. Here's Cookie, uh, Vindaloo, and our little doling Stella Luna. So why goats? Goats can work near water bodies where machines would have some trouble sort of working on, um, oh, sorry, chemicals, you can't spray chemicals. And then goats can also have no problem with steep slopes. So a heavy machine couldn't um, maneuver as easily on a steep slope. And even humans, it's sort of tricky to uh, maneuver a big um, weed whacker when you're on a bit of a slope and it can be potentially quite dangerous. And they're also fun to see in public areas. This is sort of my token photo for that. Uh, the goats are working near a water body. This is up at Logan Lake. Uh, they're on a, a bit of a slope here and they're next to a, a walkway. So we are able to chat with the, the public as they walk by and um, talk about what the goats are doing, why they're here and answer any questions that um, people walking by may have. Now, um, this is uh, Conrad Lindblom up on his horse there and, and his little, um, a few of his, his goats. And that is how I actually became involved with goats for invasive species management. Here's another photo of Conrad up there on the hill on his, one of his horses. And the goats again on a, on a pretty steep slope and they're managing it with no problem uh, up there eating the weeds and sort of a, along uh, the roadway there. And Conrad and Donna work for Rocky or own Rocky Ridge Vegetation Control. They're based, they've moved now to Viva Lodge, Alberta. I wanna say they're in their sort of third retirement phase. So they're kind of done with uh, working, but at the time when I did my master's, they were, they were still pretty active. 
and I met uh, Conrad and Donna up at Logan Lake. They, we were there with BCIT. One of our classes brought us to Logan Lake and we were building wetlands, which is a pretty neat project in itself. Uh, definitely loved the program at BCIT. And Conrad had brought his goats to give us a demo uh, and they ate a bunch of Canada thistle and other weeds in the area. And I thought, hey, this is pretty effective and it's fun to see the goats working instead of sort of spraying chemicals or having big heavy machines in the area. And then I moved on to um, the master's program in eco ecological restoration at SFU and BCIT, the joint program, lots of great fun. And I wanted, when we were th thinking about thesis projects, I wanted something that I was passionate about, something that I was really interested in instead of sort of picking from a list and um, doing any project. Uh, so I emailed Conrad and Donna Lindblom and sort of said, hey, like, can you let me come up and collect a little bit of data before uh, your goats go into the site? And then I'll, I would love to come back and collect more data afterwards. So they, they then offered me a job actually for the entire summer and I said, sure, like, let's do it. And so I, I packed up my truck with all my camping gear and, and headed up to Kamloops at the time uh, and met them and worked for, for the summer. And uh, I ended up herding 350 goats on horseback, uh, sort of in the saddle for eight hours a day. And then I would go out um, after uh, in the evenings after we brought the goats back to camp and uh, go out and collect my data with my little notebook and all the things. So I can definitely say that I have the neatest project of my cohort, maybe not the best, but uh, one of the neatest for sure. So a few other projects that I've worked on um, to start the BCIT wetlands uh, at Logan Lake. We had the goats come in and eat the thistle there. That was my sort of introduction. I've also read a few papers and done some presentations um, from the literature uh, on goats and it was English ivy mostly in one of the parks in uh, the United States. And then for my thesis research, I worked mainly in the interior of BC in the Okanagan, uh, working on sulfur sink foil and spotted knapweed. You'll see some of my data there a little bit later on. Uh, I actually did a, a volunteer invasive species removal event with Still Moon. That was sort of our introduction first on, on our own uh, with my first goat, Logan. I named him after Logan Lake, of course. Um, my friend Chloe was working for Still Moon at the time and said, hey, bring your goat out. We're having this invasive species pull. And so I loaded, loaded uh, Logan up in the truck and came down uh, and yeah, it was great fun. He, we were working on Blackberry at the time uh, up at Renfrew Creek. And we, along with Still Moon, uh, we got to be on the news. I think it was global and uh, CTV, so that was pretty fun. We've also worked on projects in Chilliwack. Uh, it was mostly Japanese knotweed in Chilliwack. And then we did a demonstration at the University of Fraser Valley um, on knotweed as well. There's a pretty neat time lapse if you guys can find it um, of the goats just decimating a patch of spotted knapweed. It's pretty. Pretty good. Um, and then we've also worked for BC Timber Goats, Bruce Bradley. So he just started a company um, sort of in the Northern BC region um, this two, two summers ago. I've worked with him in Lumbee. And then this past summer, we we're up near Prince George on the cut block. I have a couple of photos of, of that project coming up. And then here in Nanaimo, we've worked in um, a few different uh, sites within the community here. So this is one of our projects last summer. These are the goats in the backyard here working on some morning glory. It's pretty cute to watch. They've just sort of slurp it up like spaghetti. This is Sandwich, Celaluna, and Bindaloo. A couple of our goats there. Are they cute? Uh, so here's my partner Jasper and we're up um, on a cut block sort of in between Vanderhoof and Prince George, pretty in the middle of nowhere, sort of down three different logging roads. Uh, we camped there for, I was there for just over a month. So a bit of a, uh, a field season up there. We had about 200 goats. Uh, we we're on foot in this steep, gnarly, poor terrain cut block. 
Uh, and we had one herd dog. So it was uh, quite the experience for sure. Um, and we were targeting, the goats were targeting Aspen and Alder in order for the, the owners of the land to plant lodgepole pine. Um, now, browse, uh, goats are browsers, so it's important to think about the number of goats per area or density of uh, targeted plant. Um, so here you can see Jasper is leaning down on the bushy tree to send those branches down into one clump. And whenever you do this, you'd have sort of 10 or 15 goats charge towards you and start nibbling away at all of all of the plants, um, all of the leaves at the top there that are available in a nice juicy clump. So it was pretty fun to watch. Um, and then the photo next to Jasper, you can see she's done this herself. So she's straddled the, the tree and she's walked up it a bit and is bending the tree over so she can get at those juicy leaves at the top. So goats are pretty smart. They're um, sometimes a little too clever, um, but this is a, a great illustration of um, the goats using their little brains to get, get those weeds. Now, because we're in such an open area, the goats sort of would nibble a little bit of a, a bushy plant or leaf and move on. Um, so we ended up having to concentrate them in a smaller area in order for them to be the most effective and really get all of those leaves which ended up working quite well um, at the end of our project there. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my thesis research. Uh, my paper is called The Efficacy of Goat Browsing on Invasive Plant Spe Species in British Columbia. And this little cute um, heart-shaped petal um, flower it was one of the main species I worked on. It's called the sulfur sink oil. It has a sort of a, a weed shaped leaf, sort of very jaggedy toothed leaves, and then these cute little pale uh, yellow flowers. And this is the herd here having a bit of a, a break under the shade of some lodgepole pines. Uh, one of the herd dogs named Sam, little German Shepherd, and that's the horse I got to borrow. His name was Maverick. He was pretty awesome. Um, so the, the goats We'll work sort of in the morning, we'll bring them out in the morning from camp and then they'll, they'll eat all the, a bunch of weeds and then they'll have to have a bit of a break and chew their cud and, and have a rest and then they'll get up a short while later and continue on their browsing. So it gave us a bit of a break as well. Sometimes we'd, we'd hop down from the saddle and give our, give our legs a little bit a stretch as well. And as I mentioned, once uh, the day was sort of through, we would bring the goats back to camp to have, so they could have a rest and a bunch of water and just be one concentrated in one area, um, safe from predators. And then I would go out and collect my data. So this is kind of what that would look like. Uh, that's me up there on Maverick. Isn't it cute? <laughs> um, and then this is kind of what my saddle would look like typically in a day. I have my little sweater or jacket, depending on what the weather is doing. Um, some clippers there for the wire for my uh, exclosures. And then in my saddle bag, I had uh, flags and flagging tape and nails to mark my plots, as well as my notebook and water and whatever else I needed. And there's a photo of one of the herd dogs Digger, he's an Australian cattle dog, also a very good boy. So a little bit about my methods and data collection here. So I had sample and control plots. I used a one meter by one meter quadrat frame. I collected pre and post browse data, including number of seed heads, percent, and I divided those into percent cover classes as well as recorded height classes. Of course, I photo monitored sort of before and after um, to get that dramatic effect. Um, and then did a native plant species inventory as well. So this is a photo of one of my exposures. So it's not allowing the goats to come into this small little area and eat the weeds just to see the difference in the area. So this was a field of the sulfur sink oil plant and uh, I excluded them from this little one meter square uh, frame so that we could get a, a visual uh, depiction of what that looks like. And then of course, we 
once the, I took this photo, I removed the TFOS and the exposure to allow the goats to clean up those weeds so that there aren't any seeds in that soil seed bank. Very important to do. <laughs> so a few of my results here. Here are some qualitative um, results. This is a sulfur sample. This is my typical, what my typical plot looked like. So I had my quadrat frame, my little ruler and my notebook and I would count all of the flowers and all of the seed heads and the heights of the stems. Um, sort of looking back at it, <laughs> I did a fair bit of work, um, pretty funny. And here's what a typical plot would look like after the goats had gone through the area. And so you can see the stems uh, are quite bare. The flowers are gone. Um, no more seed heads in this particular photo, at least. Um, and then there's a few leaves low down to the to the ground there, um, but the leaves are the the stems are pretty bare of the leaves up high. And I recorded the the height class of the bare stems as well. So they're doing a pretty good job. Pretty awesome little browsers. And here are some qual quantitative results here. Numbers. Um, this these bars show the number of seed heads. Um, along the bottom there, I broke it up into density classes. So seed heads per square meter, just to get a better visualization of, of what that sort of looks like. Uh, so the lighter green bars show pre-browse and then the dark green bars show the numbers of seed heads after the goats had gone through and eaten all of the weeds or most of them. Uh, so you can see the goats are doing a pretty good job um, the worst one here, I think, is four seed heads per square meter, and that's in the density class from 46 to 60 seed heads per square meter starting out. So it's a pretty significant difference. The goats are definitely eating the weeds. I'm not sure if you can see some of these bars because they're so small. Uh, um, so obviously we can take the goats back through the area. Um, after having seen this data here, just to clean up and get those last few seed heads out of that soil seed bank, potentially. And here's a few more qualitative results. Uh, this is some spotted knapweed. Uh, this is up at Logan Lake as well. I took this photo right as we brought the goats onto the site. So just a sea of purple flowers and some goats in there kind of hiding behind those weeds because they're so big. Uh, and there's that same site just a few hours later, actually. So the goats have eaten all of those purple flowers, which is great news because that's where <laughs> the seeds come from. So no flowers, no seeds, um, and potentially, hopefully no more weeds the following year and following season. Let me take a little, little bit of a look at that. Now here's another photo showing common tansy and then some spotted knapweed in the background. So here's some before and after as well. I have a, a little water bottle there for scale just to show how big that clump of weeds is. Uh, you can see that they, they definitely like the common tansy. Uh, most of the, the leaves are gone from the stems as well. Now my study was conducted over just one field season, but to be most effective, it should be an iterative process over several, several seasons and even several times per season. And we need to make sure that we monitor to determine the success of the restoration treatment. And here's a little list of, a small list of uh, species that goats will consume. So Himalayan blackberry is a big one that we often get asked if the goats will eat. They will eat it for sure. They um, love to chew on the, the big juicy leaves and flowers first, and they'll use their pretty amazing lips and get around all of those thorns because yes, as many of us know, blackberry is a pretty nasty, spiky uh, invasive. So the goats are pretty amazing at working on, on the Himalayan blackberry for sure. Uh, this is Logan in my backyard at, in Coquitlam uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, working on the ivy that we had growing up one of our trees in the backyard. Uh, and Logan here in Stella Luna working on some thistle and blackberry 
in one of our last contracts here on the island. Now I have Japanese knotweed up here um, on our list that the goats will consume, um, but it is, it is a bit of a tricky one because um, it's a nasty weed. Um, it can grow from just a little fragment. And so we need to make sure that the goats have eaten all the little bits off of each other and sort of even quarantine them into an area before we move to a different site and give them a brush and, and pick their hooves. Uh, just to make sure we're not passing, spreading that weed any more than it is capable of doing all on its own. So here's a big patch of uh, Japanese knotweed. This is one of the demonstrations we did uh, in Chilliwack there. It's uh, along a little bit of a river, so um, it would not be feasible to spray chemicals right here, or even stem inject them might be a tricky, tricky situation as well. So goats do enjoy the Japanese knotweed. Uh, it's a big, juicy, leafy weed. Uh, so they definitely like to eat it. Uh, and they'll step on the, the larger stems and sort of bend or break them so they can, they can eat the weeds up at the top there. Uh, so here's that same patch just a little while later. So they're definitely, they're definitely munching away on that area. I think we had just 20 or 30 goats on this site. So not the full herd, but they, they were eating away at this nasty weed. Um, and like I mentioned before, they, there's a pretty neat time lapse of uh, a patch in, at the University of the Fraser Valley um, of the goats just decimating a big patch of Japanese knotweed. And in a very short period of time, they must have been quite hungry. And some invasive plants that um, are not good for goats, invasive and um, thank you, um, sort of ornamental plants as well. So as most of the shiny leaf plants that aren't good for goats, um, including Daphne, which is abundant here on the island and rhododendron, which is a beautiful plant that many people have in their garden as well. An interesting one um, is bracken fern. So bracken fern, interferes or interrupts the thiamine intake. Uh, it contains an enzyme that destroys uh, thiamine and the goats actually need thiamine in at least trace amounts in order to uh, thrive. So a bit of a summary here um, about goats and what they can do. So some benefits, they fertilize their soil through the droppings, great little compost. They're friendly, both environmentally and they love to cuddle. So goats are, are pretty fun and personable. Ours just run up to us as soon as they see us. It's pretty cute. Uh, they turn those weeds into compost that we can use um, on our gardens and it's wonderful stuff. They reduce seed viability once the seeds pass through uh, their gut and through their rumen. They also have a lower, lower soil compaction and even aerate the soil. They can work on steep slopes and near water bodies where big machines cannot, and we can't spray chemicals um, near water bodies as well. And there's also less green waste to remove from site. So when we weed back, all of that green waste is left on site to either rot or uh, be removed. So it's a lot less work um, in that respect because the goats are consuming it and, and turning it into compost. And of course they're fun to watch, come on, they're goats. Uh, a few drawbacks, goats can be loud. I mean, they're not quite as loud as a machine, um, but if we're working within city limits, uh, we need to be careful of, of who the neighbors are and um, how much the goats are chatting and just make sure that they have enough food so that um, they're working away and not, not having the opportunity to be too loud. Uh, it is a little bit of a slower process, I'll admit it. Um, machines can go through an area and just decimate a patch of weeds. Uh, so goats take a little bit longer than that. And it is an iterative process. We do need to come back in over um, the season and even over a few years, just to make sure we're getting all of those weeds. And they have to leave the site, I mean. <laughs> um, it's always good to have signage up. Uh, whether we're spraying pesticides or even having goats at work. Um, here, this is a, an example of sort of caution, pesticides, keep away, like keep your children away, 
make sure your dogs don't come near the site and it's very negative and sort of stay back. But um, for us, we'll have goats at work, welcome, like come say hi. Um, we'll have maybe a few that you can come and pet and interact with uh, while we chat to you about the goats. So yeah, let's talk about some positive stuff in our in our future here. So my partner and I just started um, our own little small business called Vancouver Island Goatscaping. It's landscaping with goats. Cute name, right? Um, it was last March. They were born March 15th and um, I wasn't working. So I thought, well, yeah, I can bottle raise four baby goats. I can bottle feed them four times a day, no big deal, warm up that milk, they're super cute. And so we did. And um, now they've, they've grown, they're coming up to um, their first birthday here pretty soon. Um, and they're great little workers and they've been, they've been lots of fun for sure. We have a little bit of a different method. We actually panel our goats into the target area instead of having them in a big open space. Um, they're, con they're concentrated um, in one area where we're focusing on that uh, weed of, of interest. And then we can move the panels to a different site so that the goats work in that area as well. And we found it to be quite effective. So great success so far. Um, here are the goats at one of our um, sites here in Nanaimo. <laughs> Big, huge patch of blackberry, nasty stuff. Uh, so here's Logan, the goat that I started off with from, he was actually given to me um, by Conrad and Donna at the end of the field season. He was one of the bottle babies. His mom actually died. And so I was bottle feeding him all summer. And at the end of the season, they said, hey, are you taking your goat home with you? How could I not? He was a, the cutest little baby goat. So I did, he sat on my lap the whole way home from Logan Lake and um, on the way home. And so he, he stayed in, in my backyard in Coquitlam for, uh, for a while. And now he's here with us in Nanaimo. Uh, we've had lots of inquiries uh, asking if um, there's anybody on the island or in BC even uh, who rents out their goats for invasive plant species management. I'm now the secretary of the Vancouver Island Goat Association. And so all of those inquiries are coming directly to me. And instead of passing them out to the rest of the membership, I can respond directly because we are actually the only um, members who offer this service at, at this time. Hopefully we'll expand and more people will be interested in having their goats uh, be working goats. Um, but clients have been very pleased so far and uh, we've had lots of positive feedback and people just want to learn about uh, the idea and about goats in general, which has been really awesome. So like I said, we're involved uh, with Vancouver Island Goat Association, VIGA, as well as, as well as the BC Goat Association. We've been to a few invasive species events here in Nanaimo. The latest was just down the road from us working on some blackberry, of course. Um, we're also involved in the education um, including animal husbandry and invasive plant management in general. My partner loves to have a working animal and <laughs> so that they pay their rent. So he's pleased with uh, the fact that our goats are actually working and not just pets. <laughs> the next steps are to um, involve uh, the cities and get the municipalities on board um, to allow goats within city limits. Um, to make sure we either change bylaws or have a bit of an exemption so that goats can, can be working within city limits. Right now I'm reading a book called City Goats. Uh, it's by Jenny Grant. And she advocated and was successful to have backyard, backyard goats legal in the city of Seattle, which is pretty awesome. Um, and we're actually, she started the Goat Justice League and Jasper and I are the first Canadian members, which is pretty fun. Um, goats are also an important part of farmers markets, uh, as well as local food and food security, because obviously goats uh, give us milk and cheese and soaps and fiber and of course meat. We've all heard the newest trend as well, goat yoga. So um, there's a farm just down the road from us and they do, they do goat yoga with their kids. So it's pretty fun. <laughs> have a little goat play with, play and, and learn with you. 
So not only are goats fun and cute, they're also an effective tool to manage invasive plant species on a small or large scale. Thank you. And that's it. Well, fascinating. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, yeah, we actually have, um, we've had a, a few questions um, in the chat. So maybe I'll go through those first. Yeah. And then um, once we're done those, um, I definitely encourage anyone who has questions to, to either unmute themselves or you can just write them in the chat. And, um, but yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll just go from the top here and work my way down. Perfect. Um, so Jennifer asks, do the goats get tired of invasives and go back to something they like better? Uh, how, oh, sorry, can't, there we go. How do you keep them hungry for the right plants? Great question, great question. Um, because goats, goats are browsers, they will sort of nibble one thing and move on to another. Um, so it's nice to have a bit of variety. Um, of weeds that they are targeting. And they will sort of avoid one plant and, and prefer another. Um, and to get them onto eating one weed in particular, we'll introduce them to that weed um, in their sort of home site first. So we'll bring sort of a bunch of morning glory and toss it into them so that they can get used to it and, and want to eat that. Um, and we've done that introducing them to new species as well. Um, and it's, it's proven to be pretty effective. But yeah, they do, they do tend to nibble away at different, different uh, plant species. But they are, are also, they enjoy eating weeds, they're browsers. So instead of chewing on grass, mostly like a, a, a sheep would, uh, they enjoy the, the bushy weeds. So they like to eat them. Great. Um, the next question uh, from Ava is, can they eat baby's breath? I think, I'm not sure I know that plant, but I'm assuming um, it's a plant. I'm trying to think, our herd has not been introduced to baby's breath. We don't really have it where we are here. Um, but when we worked in the interior, there was a bit and they nibbled on it. Um, but it wasn't part of, a major part of my study. So um, they will eat it, but I don't have a lot of data to back that up for you. <laughs> right. Um, Ms. Gibbs, uh, Gibbons asks, uh, in Ontario, we have a big problem, or I guess it's a comment, we have a big problem with wild parsnip. Not 100% sure if it's safe for them. It causes burns on human skin, so there is a big push to get rid of it. So I guess, yeah, so, I guess it goes, kind of goes to what you were mentioning earlier about uh, maybe the more noxious plants so the ghosts yeah. not, won't necessarily um, eat them because they'll get a they'll get sick and yeah yeah exactly and, among other factors right they'll nibble them a little bit um, and sort of move on to the next so that's one they will avoid um, mm -hmm. the Daphne as well can cause birth defects in um, cows and horses mm -hmm. and so we don't say yes they'll eat it sign us up for that contract um but they'll nibble away at it in small amounts and and that's okay if they do have a pretty small or strong gut in in that respect but we're not going to um say yes to contracts that is primarily uh toxic to them for sure we're going to mm -hmm. keep keep our babies healthy first and yeah, foremost absolutely um, Caitlin Connor asks, uh, do you need to kill the goats after the season is over? Good question. That's a real question. <laughs> um, mm. No, you do not have to. Um, some people do when they send them to auction, especially if, if you have sort of two or 300 goats. That's a lot of goats to take through the winter and it gets quite expensive. Um, this year we just had the five and so we definitely brought them through the winter and um, paid for their feed and, and their housing as well. Um, coming up, we'll have probably 10 or 15 more goats and we will have to make that decision if we are willing to bring them through the winter or um, take them to the auction or otherwise process them it is a reality you do need, do need to um 
adjust your herd management techniques for sure. Um, right. And and what that future looks like. So you don't have to, but you do need to think of um, of that logically and financially mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, Monica asks, uh, do the goats increase? How do the goats increase aeration in the soil? So because they have such small little hooves. So if you run an aerator, if you've seen, they, they lift up the little pucks and the smallest goats will have that same sort of um, size hoof that um, will penetrate the soil. Bit of a stretch, I'll admit it, but yeah, more, <laughs> they're not right. going to come back the soil more so. Um, just to add to the previous comment question, mm -hmm. um, we, as a byproduct from the milking industry, many people don't wish to keep the bucklings and so they come to us and so we're, we're saving them right off the bat from well being bopped on the head actually is is the term that um members have used so when the bucklings come out and and they they see that they're male they don't want them for the milking industry and so they dispose of them unfortunately and so we're saving them um, from mm. that immediate death and uh, having them help us in the field season, um, hopefully for longer than just the, the one season, but um, definitely right. adding to their lives. And we weather our goats as well. So um, we castrate them so that they're not as smelly and um, rambunctious as bucks. And so they're, they're called weathers and they, they're actually a, a great addition to the herd. Well, um, Willoughby asks, uh, what about Scotch broom? Good question. Um, Scotch broom is definitely a, a nasty one. They love to eat the seed pods. Um, they're like crunchy little chips, which is pretty fun um, to hear them crunching away. And the flowers especially, and, and new fresh um, green stems they'll eat. Um, but you really have to concentrate them in the area in order for them to really work at it. We haven't had a contract with Scotch Broom specifically yet, but we've definitely taken them. We go on hikes with them, and so we try to concentrate them in, in one area so that they'll eat the Scotch Broom. So yes, they'll eat it, um, maybe not decimate it. We're hoping to even maybe add pigs to the herd so that they um, will dig up the roots of the blackberry and Scotch Broom. So down the road, potential. Uh, Jennifer asks, what about buttercup? They will eat it. Yeah, it is a little bit lower to the ground. And so because they're browsers, they prefer um, plants that are a little bit higher up. Um, maybe if we were to add sheep, they would <laughs> prefer the, the buttercup. But yes, they'll eat it in small amounts. Great. Uh, thanks so every and uh, by the way, thanks so much everyone for your questions. These are really great. And yeah, thank you, Natasha, for for being so thorough and answering them. Uh, Caitlin asked, um, do the goats affect the soil through grazing and trampling? Will this affect regrowth of native species? Great question. Um, they won't necessarily eat the grass because it's I think it comprises ten percent of their diet, so they're looking at sort of the higher species. Um, but if you have a herd of 350 goats going through one small area, they will um, sort of turn up the soil a little bit. Um, so it's important to remember sort of where you're going through. Um, if there's a, a sensitive habitat, let's spread the goats out so they're not all sort of stampeding through this one little area. Um, with our goats, we just have um, we'll have probably 20 total and they'll be in smaller areas. So um, we're not wor too worried about the soil being damaged too much, um, but it is something to keep in mind um, that we'll have to watch to see what um, native and rare plants are there. Sure, good question. Mm -hmm. uh, will be asked, uh, do certain weeds strongly affect the flavor of meat and or milk? Also, is paneling fencing the only way to keep them off plants you want to protect? Great questions. Yeah, so what it's yeah, kind of like 
a bee and it's honey, it uh, the meat does uh, get affected by what the goats are eating. I just spoke with um, a friend and they had one of their um, bucks still drinking from its mom and um, right up until they processed him and they they said he was delicious. So um, definitely, definitely a good one there. Uh, we might have to do some experiments about, about that to see sort of concentrate one goat on one particular plant and have them eat all the yummy things and, and see how the meat is. But um, maybe we'll get there eventually. Um, so yeah, it, it does affect the taste of the meat. And if we're milking, it will affect the taste of the milk as well. Um, paneling is not the only way. No, we actually just, um, the photo of the puppy at the beginning of my presentation, that's our new herd dog. He's a a Beauceron, it's a French herding dog. Um, and so we're hoping that we'll get to use him to herd the goats as well. Um, the panels work great because we can leave the site and leave the goats to do their work. Um, but no, it's not the only method at, at all. Um, as with my thesis, we were on horseback with a few herd dogs, but that was in big open areas. So in the city, it is it is easier and uh, efficient to use the panels and it's safe too is the main one mm -hmm. yeah will be i have a follow-up question of, yeah what about like um say you had one to one or a few goats only yes and you were to kind of have them with like a collar and tie them up to a specific spot yes. that, that works well too and then they can kind of eat that radius and yes you, you answered my question, the, your own question. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we have tried that a bit. Um, those, yeah, the common sort of around and around and around and eat the weeds. Um, it is pretty effective, but you need to make sure that they're not going to tangle themselves up and it, it needs to be monitored a lot more closely than the panels. Um, they can get spooked by cars going by or whatever else and and rip out um, the tether or even break their collars, which isn't ideal and, and not so safe. So the panels are, are the safest option we've found. But um, if there's a patch of weeds, then we'll take one or two over on a leash with their collars and, and have them target those those little areas. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Uh, I think I may have missed this question by Elena. Um, I'll ask it again and let me know if I already asked you, Natasha. Yeah. But um, this question is, how can the goats digest the invasive species seeds, i.e. can seeds survive in their scat? Or is it better to just target rays before plants start to seed? Yeah, so definitely a good idea before uh, the plants are in that seed set stage. Um, that's the most effective way to do it. But there have been studies where seeds have passed through their digestive system and have been not able to germinate so they're no longer viable which is pretty amazing it's sort of maybe a phd if i want to do it but no um uh, there's some sort of enzyme in their gut that destroys the seeds um and even the mastication so they they'll regurgitate their cut and chew um that up again and so maybe that is part of it as well and really just damages the casing of the seeds and so the seeds are no longer viable or very very low viability um which is pretty awesome good question well yeah that's that's fascinating because i guess there um i know like for many of the invasive plants at least the ones that are legally uh regulated right now that's one of the biggest issues with um with just super high, um, just like seed viability, right? So that's really interesting that the goats are able to kind of mitigate that in some way. Yeah, and even just to have sort of the, the seeds being deposited in, in a nice big fresh pile of fertilizer from a cow or whatever is, is not ideal. I think you can see that in a pasture, yeah. a plant yeah, yeah. growing out of a nice um, cow pie, which is not ideal. So yeah, the goats mm -hmm. are, unique unique in that way for sure you know i had a question about the um the knotweed treatment that you've done i guess mm -hmm. um i guess one of the the biggest issues not that i mean one of the biggest issues is that a that it does 
reproduced from such a small fragment, you know, like two millimeters. Yeah. What I've heard. Um, yeah. And then, uh, but also just the, um, I guess the plant is exasperated to grow further if it's cut mechanically. So I'm not sure like if having a, a ha yeah, what, what have you seen with the goats in that respect? Like do the, does the knotweed come back bigger than what it was mm -hmm. prior to? Um, yes, I wish I had gone back to the site to see. Um, I guess we still could now, but yep, that is a concern for sure. Um, not, not weed is definitely one of those nasty plants. Um, I'm not sure if the goats, I, I want to say I did read it somewhere, or maybe I, we we're just talking about it, then maybe they have an enzyme in their saliva or some sort of um, compound that um, prevents the plant from, from growing. Um, don't quote me on that, but <laughs> um, instead of it being sort of waxed or cut off, the goats are a different mechanism. Um, but yeah, that is a concern. And that's why we need to go back to the site again for another treatment. Um, and I, I would be hesitant to sort of guarantee that one because it is such a nasty plant. Um, a good way to start and um, get ahead and get a, a bunch of that foliage above ground biomass away and composted, but right. not going to guarantee that that nasty one won't grow back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be definitely. honest with that one. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's I guess it's kind of the um, the one of the bigger bigger issues right now. Yeah, um, yes. not just here, but across the world but yes um but ava ava has another question so uh I, she asked who was who are your main clients so who are your main clients mm -hmm. uh, do you do a lot of work in parks or mainly for individuals what is the plan for the future and do you hope to work with the city you're living to manage invasives great question um so so far they've been mostly um backyards and and people's properties um one woman, they just moved to the site and wanted to clean up their, their backyard. So we helped out with our goats. Um, we want to get involved with the city as well. With the other company here on the island has worked with the city and the parks department um, and they've had some positive feedback there. So we would like to get those contracts this upcoming season. And then we, in the future, we'd love to have the bigger contracts with sort of BC Hydro and the um, underneath the power lines there. That would be a good one to sort of secure and then do the smaller jobs and backyards and for um, smaller sites that are that are interested for sure. I don't think I want 300 goats, um, but maybe upwards of close to 50 um, if we if we were to grab those those bigger contracts. Did I answer all of those questions? Did I miss one? Uh, I, I think you spoke to most of them. I guess. Uh, do you feel like? Do you hope to work with the city you're living to manage invasives? I don't think yes. you mentioned that one. Yeah, that's that's our sort of next steps is to get the city on board and mm -hmm. um, even hiring us as well, <laughs> for sure. Right. Uh, Gabriel asks, uh, have you compared the GOAT method costs to other methods such as mechanical or chemical? Yeah, we've done some comparisons um, and they are fairly comparable. Um, some people like to be on site 24-7 um, with their GOATs and that brings up the cost a little bit. Um, but with the panels, we... in certain areas where we're able to uh, leave the goats to do their work on their own and then just check check on them. So that brings our costs way down. Um, it's actually pretty expensive to have someone come to your site with all of their equipment. Um, I didn't think that was the case, but um, it's fairly expensive. And so this, we're trying out different um, costs and... Um, pardon? Yeah, they and innovating what else we can sort of do with the goats and um, how to make it affordable for people. So sometimes when you, you give a quote, and it's different for every site and, and every individual um, 
weed and sort of how how big is the area what's the density what weed are we working with so it's really tricky to give just a, a general quote um but it is comparable and it, um it's quite a niche sort of um industry and those who are interested are, are wanting this sort of greener um alternative method to control their plants and so they're not looking to spray chemicals or or use machines so um the clients want the goats there um, so that they, they are often willing to spend that money. Um, when we were in Prince George area, it, the cost was comparable to having um, people come in with their big uh, brush cutters and um, chopping down all of the, the alder and aspen, which I thought was quite interesting because it was a very large area. So yeah, it's kind of neat to see that those numbers are comparable and we're not just crazy goat people. <laughs> Um, can I can I ask a question, Natasha? I'm just wondering yeah. what your current situation is. Do you just have like an acre and five goats on it, or are you, are you trying to get a farm so that you can raise crops to feed them over the winter? Or what's yeah, your, great what's question. Um, we were initially looking for a property, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's expensive out there. I don't know if you guys know that. <laughs> um, and we had the babies just in our backyard um last spring and into the summer um bottle feed of them but then uh it's not legal in the city of Nanaimo quite yet and so we were asked to move them from the site um and I knew this that 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 would happen and so we we signed up for um a land matching program through young agrarians and so it's it's a I don't know if you guys have heard of it but it's a, a really wonderful program people have land and we needed the land and so we are matched with this younger couple in Cedar which is 15 minutes from our house and they just bought a property with 12 acres and so we're we are matched and they said hey bring your goats over and it happened to work out um pretty perfectly with the timing and the bylaw officer <laughs> saw that we had five goats in our backyard and so we just loaded them up and brought them over to the property and now they have tons of space and we've built these people a fence for our goats but um it's been a great partnership and so um they're excited for us to have more goats there in the spring and to grow our company so it's it's been a really great um opportunity and building this relationship with them so we can just sort of live vicariously through them and have their use their property but also help them with the property so it's been really really great thank you thank you that's really interesting yeah uh miss gibbon mentions uh look into the canadian agricultural loans act that's how um that's how we purchased our farm so maybe awesome. yeah maybe maybe it's something to look into Thank you. I'm just writing this down. <laughs> Canadian Super. Agricultural it, Loans Act. It's, you, you access it through your bank. Okay. Um, any bank in Canada can get it, but it, and it's up to, to 500000 but it's for starting like agricultural businesses, but you can use it for land purchase with only 10% down, which if you've looked into any mortgaging any land, it's like 25%. Yes. Oh, interesting. It's the only Good possible one. way for... Yeah. Right. We're just a young Thank couple you. too, like to buy a farm, right? It's it's yeah. everything's ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> thing to ask about at your bank. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, that's a great tip. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, um, yeah, I was really curious, Natasha, about uh, I guess the training of the I guess the dogs and, and maybe and the goats and like I guess like you know have there been situations where like you're not able to to have them kind of like be able to do work because they're just kind of doing their own thing or like yeah what I don't know what what does that look like <laughs> yeah I've had some adventures with the goats for sure um we took I think we took maybe 10 or 20 down to a, a campsite um when we were working in near near Ver, no near in Vermeer um in yeah interior BC and 
we brought the horses and these goats just to give a little demonstration. And I think the local paper was there and maybe maybe a video camera. And we happened to bring uh, one of the goats that Conrad and Donna had named the jumper. I thought, uh oh, like this probably isn't a good good plan. But in the trailer, she she went, so she came along with us. And um, partway through the demonstration, she decided to take off, and she took sort of five or six other goats with her. And so we jumped on the horses and chased them down and all up through the hills and up and down. And it was quite the adventure, but um, not super great. So yes, they sometimes do get away from you um, in that sort of situation. Um, that's where the panels are quite nice. They're in a small enclosure. And then I guess also the training and sort of how you raise the goats is a factor as well. Um, with Conrad's goats, as well as Bruce's, they're not sort of hand tame at all. There may be a few that are bottle fed that will come up to you. And so they're very skittish and they'll run away from people and dogs and whatever else, something that spooks them. Um, whereas our goats, they've been bottle, bottle raised and they come on hikes with us and we don't even have leashes anymore. They'll just sort of trot along beside us and make sure that we're not too far away from them. It's pretty super cute, <laughs> um, but they'll come to us. And so we're, it's a different sort of method. And um, so we can guide them to the weeds instead of corralling them, um, going sort of herding them to the weeds. And so the dog is mostly in case some get away and just to have that presence, but um, it's a different method to have um, friendlier goats that will stick with you. Um, Another little story, when we were up in Prince George, um, Bruce decided to add 80 more goats to the already established herd, which can be a tricky thing to do when you're in the middle of nowhere with no fences. And uh, sure enough, I woke up in the morning, I was on the, the early shift and we got up there at, I think it was, I think, it, I think my shift started at six. So just as the sun was coming up um, and no goats were anywhere to be seen on this sort of 38 hectare plot we we're working on. Um, so we, I panicked, ran down to the, the tent to grab Jasper to come help me and um, spent a good couple hours trying to find these goats with our one little herd dog. Um, we ended up finding them sort of way off site eating things that they shouldn't be eating, of course, um, and ended up bringing them back okay. But yeah, it's just sort of the training part, I like to um, work on a, a more contained area before um, moving out to a big open space. Um, and as for the dog, we'll see. <laughs> he's new to us and uh, he's, made, he's pretty smart. And so we'll get him trained up and um, introduced more intimately to the goats and um, we've had a few interactions so far and he's been pretty good um, but sort of learning those techniques with the the dog as well so that he'll listen to us and and know what to do the um border collie we worked with in prince george they sort of have a mind of their own and they smart they're good herd dogs um but just know what to do and uh we'll go around the goats and um bring them back to you. So it's it's pretty neat to have that uh, extra sort of brain and hand uh, in situations like that. But yeah, the training is a often a fun adventure, let's call it. Totally. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Well, yeah, I, I just want to make sure everyone has had an opportunity to, to ask questions if they haven't. Um, yeah, Natasha, just so you know, there's been a lot of folks saying thank you uh, that this was very informative um, and interesting. Awesome. Uh, Elena says that you should do a PhD on the um, <laughs> the uh, seed viability via the goats. So that's yeah. kudos for that. <laughs> no, and yeah, and, and I agree too. Thanks so much, Natasha, for sharing what you've um, what you've been doing. It's Thank been a really yeah. interesting perspective. So it yeah. is sort of a tricky thing. We're even talking with like the Vancouver Island Goat Association and BC Goat. There isn't a lot of research being done. Mm -hmm. on goats at all, let alone invasive species management, even sort of 
milk um, production and and um, hay analysis is is just not a right. lot. There, there's not a lot of data out there, which is unfortunate, but we're hoping to add to it a little bit at least. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Does anyone have um, Does anyone have some more questions? Um, I'll just uh, I'll leave the floor open. Please feel free to to unmute yourselves or or to write. And uh, and Elena, you're welcome. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, for um, happy I've been able to 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 connect with Natasha for this and uh, and for the other folks presenting in our series. So yeah, thank you so much, Natasha, for for uh, for willing to be on board. Yeah, thanks um, for having me, and thank you all for <laughs> attending. Awesome. <laughs> nice. Great. Um, oh, and uh, Ava mentions that, um, yeah, the Invasive Species Council of BC would love a goat partner. That's what, oh, cool. What OK, <laughs> super. <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious. Have you, um, I guess, have you um, been in contact with any of those folks? Like, I guess there's, of course, ICBC, uh, the Vice Peace Council of British Columbia, and then there's Vice Peace Council of Metro Vancouver. And I'm not sure if there's, <laughs> if there's um, one specifically for the island, but um, yeah, have you, um, have have you been able to be in contact with them? Is there's is that something that maybe they'd be wanting to kind of Explore. Yeah, you know, I've looked into it a bit. I guess I've been a little bit hesitant, nervous to contact them, but I, I mean, of course, mm -hmm. like, why not open, open the conversation? Yeah, that's a very good point. I should do that. <laughs> not yeah, be I mean, so shy and whatever else, but yeah. No, I mean, um, it seems like there's, uh, I mean, it seems like there's, there's uh, some interesting benefits to, to that process. And so, and it could be useful, especially around, um, uh, areas where uh, traditional treatments aren't viable. So yeah, yeah I mean, it could be, it could be a thing. Yeah, so. or even to have sort of one application and, and clean up the rest with another method, um, sort of using a few different methods, I think would be effective as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my hope is to have the goats come through and clean up the weeds and then We'll go into the area and plant native plant species. That was my initial hope with uh, yeah this project. With my ecological restoration backward background, right? <laughs> Just mm -hmm. that sure. always in mind. For sure. Um, any anyone else have some questions? I I did have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to think of how to word it though. Um, I'm thinking about, is there like a certain calculation you use for how many goats for how long on each kind of plot? And it, does that depend on which species you're targeting? Like how many, just where we're coming from is on our own property. We're just kind yeah. of, we're just managing it on our own property and we're right. just wanting to preserve our land, you know, for the wildlife and, and the native species basically mm -hmm. to exist with our goats more than- right. To, you know it is good if we are targeting invasive species and I need to kind of um, look into what those are on our property but just like basically I don't want to overgraze and I don't want yes yes to to hurt our land right so that's yeah I'm just trying to think of how to prevent that overgrazing like making sure we do it is it just by site like how long you leave them on each spot kind of thing yeah, it's very site dependent for sure. So you have to think about at the area, what species are there, how dense the foliage is and um, native and um, invasive species. Whereabouts are you? Um, we're in Ontario. Okay. We're between, like we're in Napanee, so we're between Kingston, like we're near Kingston area. Okay, and, and, what, spe what, and what weeds are you targeting? Um, well, that's what I, I haven't identified yet. So I'm thinking oh, okay. once it's spring, get right, it. Yeah. My, <laughs> and things the, are growing the conservation again. authority over yeah. here to like help yeah. me identify because I, I don't have knowledge of that, like what exactly right. targeting. But I yeah. just want to 
sure that I'm not hurting any of the native species. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah, even just to do a plant inventory is super and that's yeah, a good I think starting that's point. something we need to do for sure. Yeah. Because they, if they're left in an area that, um, yeah, there are they're just more goats at, per sort of square meter, then yeah, they, they will eat away um, the natives potentially and the weeds as well. So it is, it's a, it's a monitored and managed uh, method for sure. How many goats do you have? Um, we have 40 does and then we also raise a lot of buck kids. Oh, fun. Right on. Now I have 38 bottle babies. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's <laughs> a busy. little bit insane. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Very yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested. And are you milking as well? No, because of, you know, all the, like we milk, so we milk our does and then we feed the milk, like we leave the babies on our does and yeah. then but we also milk them once their babies are old enough. And then we use that milk to feed our bucklings. Oh, perfect. Thank Very you. Fun. Just to do it the hard way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just <laughs> more work in there for you. Yeah. Classic goat keeper, right? It just, yeah, just the crazy goat lady. Over yeah, there. that's cute. Yeah. <laughs> minus the crazy, <laughs> minus the crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, folks, is there um, any other questions? I feel like, yeah, there's been a bunch of uh, people that have signed off. So uh, maybe uh, maybe this is a good time to, to wrap up. So I just wanted to make sure everyone has an opportunity to ask if there's any more questions. And um, yeah, I'll leave the floor open. And just in the meantime, though, thank you so much to everyone in that, that has been here and that has been here um, since the beginning. Super appreciate all of your your questions, and this has been a really fruitful discussion. And so, thank thank you, Natasha, for uh, for your time and for your for your knowledge. Uh, it's been really great. Uh, super stoked that this was uh, th that this happened. So so yeah, um, please anybody feel free. If any last questions, and if not, um, we'll wrap it up. And Natasha, I'll just speak with you. I'll I'll send you an email about the invoice and all that stuff. So. Uh, Sounds tomorrow. great. Thank you. Yep, you're very welcome. Very fun. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but yeah, people are just like, thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, oh. Ruby says, thanks, Natasha and the stream keepers. Yes, thank you, stream keepers. Um, oh, wait. Uh, ch -ch -ch. More. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, Caitlin says this was a great learning experience. Awesome. Well, thank you and, so much. That's and Joshua great. says uh, really interesting info. And thank you again, Natasha and Adrian. And yeah, you're very welcome, Joshua. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, if that's, uh, I think that's a wrap. So um, yeah, okay. I'm going to stop the recording here.